Throughout the C8 Corvette's release, all the hype has circled around one major buzzword. And that buzzword is mid-engine. And that's sort of old news. But more recently, there's also been talks and leaked footage regarding the upcoming C8 Z06 using another very European technology. And that is a flat plane crank engine. And that is super cool that that is going into an American mid-engine car. So today, I wanna take a look at the C8 and first explain why mid-engine is, well, it's better, it just is. But there's more science to it and we're gonna get into it. And then we're gonna dive into the difference between a normal cross-plane crankshaft and a flat-plane crank and why the Corvettes move from one to the other is actually a pretty big deal. It took them over 60 years to pull the trigger on this technology. Let's find out why. Before we get into the nitty gritty of the C8 Corvette, wouldn't it be nice if you had your own C8 Corvette? This is your chance to win one. That's right, to support a great cause, our friends over at Amaze are offering you the chance to win a 2020 Corvette Stingray Z51 with taxes and shipping included and $20,000 for whatever the heck you want. All you have to do is head over to Omaze dot com slash donut and enter for your chance to win. I put the link in the description below. Honestly, guys, you could be driving a 2020 Corvette. That's that's insane. Just do it. Click the link below. Go win you a Corvette. Talks of a mid-engine Corvette have been around since the 1960s, but finally GM has delivered with the C8. And if we look at the majority of cars on the road today, the engine is in the front. Only high-end sports cars from the likes of Ferrari, Lamborghini, and Pontiac use the mid-engine design. What up, my Fiero fans? Heck yeah. So if they use it, there must be a good reason, right? Let's break it down. Weight distribution, and this is where mid-engine comes into play in a very big way. Whenever you start changing the distribution of weight in a car, you start to change its center of gravity and its polar moment of inertia. Now, center of gravity is a pretty basic concept, and I'm sure the majority of you guys watching know what it is. But for those who might not, it's just an imaginary point in an object where the distribution of weight is equal in all directions. Now the concept of polar moment of inertia is just an extension of Newton's law of inertia. And it's how difficult it is to get an object to rotate around an axis. And here's a practical example to help better understand. If I take a baseball and I throw it in the air and I try to get it to rotate, it's pretty easy to do that, right? You can toss it up in the air and it'll spin you can see that it's spinning, right? It has a low polar moment of inertia. Now, if I were to take a baseball bat and it had the same amount of mass, same point of center of gravity, and I throw it in the air and try to get it to rotate, it is much harder. And that's because it has a high polar moment of inertia. The mass is in the ends of the bat. And the farther away from the axis of rotation the mass is, the harder it is to make it rotate. So with a mid-engine car, it has a low polar moment of inertia. The mass is more centrally located and therefore it's easier to turn the car. And in sports cars, that is a good thing. So by moving the 500 pound engine seven and a half feet backwards, as well as moving the 300 pound transmission three foot backwards, it changes the vet's polar moment of inertia. Now a bonus in moving the engine and the transmission back is that you can place the driver in a more centrally located area closer to the center of mass. Now you know that a low polar moment of inertia means the car actually turns in quicker. Well, from a driver experience, it actually feels like it's turning in quicker, which is pretty cool. So what does all those weight distribution equate to in the C8? Well, you get a 40-60 balance. That means 40% of the car's total weight is in the front and 60% is in the back. When you move the vet's heaviest component, the engine, further back behind the driver, you put more weight on the rear wheels. And that added weight effectively increases the amount of power you can put to the ground and therefore you can get up to speed quicker. Not only that, as you accelerate, the weight of the car shifts backwards, giving you more traction and further helping the car move forward quicker. Now, if we compare the C7 VET to the C8, 
the C8 gets from zero to 60 in 2.9 seconds. The C7 with the same Z51 package, it gets there almost a full second slower in 3.8 seconds. Now there are some gearing changes which cause that number to be different, but about 50% of that increase in zero to 60 time is achieved by getting more grip to the wheels. And they even designed the car to run a wider tire, a 305 wide rear tire compared to the C7 285. That's 20 more millimeters. So by managing where the weight of the vehicle is, we can improve upon the car's performance. We can load up the rear tire and get better traction and all sorts of driving situations. We can go into corners faster. We can pull more Gs without breaking traction. We can become a mid-engine American-made supercar. But what about if you want to slow down? Is there any mid-engine benefit to stopping? You bet your hot sticky buns there is. Braking. In pretty much all cars, the front brakes do the majority of the braking because as you brake, the weight of the car shifts forward in the front. Like just like the opposite when we talk about acceleration. When you accelerate, you move backward. When you brake, you move forward. And in a front engine car, this is exacerbated by the fact that there's already a lot of weight already in the front. So how does a mid-engine layout affect braking? Well, when you have a more evenly distributed car in regards to its weight, each of the four brakes can then apply braking force at each of the four wheels. And that creates more stability during braking. Also, because weight transfers forward when you brake, in a mid-engine layout, you have less mass up front and more weight on the rear wheels. And in fact, during deceleration, also known as braking, the C7 carried 66% of the car's mass on the front versus 57% on the C8. And because of that, the front brakes don't have to work as hard now. And they actually dropped the size of the front rotors and made the rears larger, which is unheard of. They went from a 13.6 inch front rotor in the C7 to a 13.3 inch rotor in the C8. And the rears went from 13.3 to 13.8 inches. They made the front smaller and the rears bigger. And look at the rotor sizes in front engine cars. The fronts are always going to be bigger because they have to work hard. But with the mid-engine car like the C8, the rears can finally carry their weight around here. <laughs> so you can see there's obviously some benefits to having a mid-engine car. And it might sound like, oh, it's pretty easy. We'll just move the engine from the front to the back. Well, actually, it's not that easy. It's actually a lot of work. I actually got to speak to one of the chief engineers on the C8, and there are a lot of engineering challenges they had to overcome when moving the engine from the front to the back. So they didn't have a mid-engine chassis in their GM fleet, and they weren't gonna go dig up old Fiero jarrings, dust those bad boys off, and kind of use what they learned back in the Fiero days. No, they had to start from scratch. So they built their first prototype, by hand and they didn't have a body for it so they disguised it in a holding ute body which is pretty cool it cost them about 10 million dollars to make they used that car as a test bed for about a year so they took everything they learned from the first prototype and they built another 15 by hand they crash tested five of them they got a bunch of information from those 15 they then a year later built another hundred again by hand two years after that straight off the bowling green kentucky plant we got our first production mid-engine corvette the c8 heck yeah brother so the c8 team had a bunch of challenges they had to face along the way i mean they had everything thrown at them and one of the main things is they had to still make and build a practical car. I mean, the majority of people who are buying Corvettes, they need luggage space. They need a spot for their golf bags. And at the end of the day, they made a mid-engine car that's, from a practicality standpoint, pretty useful. So we talked about engine placement and how they did it better, but we haven't talked about the engine and how they're making it better. Crankshaft! <laughs> <laughs> Now the engine that comes in the C8 is the 6.2 liter pushrod V8 LT2. We talked about the difference between push rods and overhead valve engines a few weeks ago, back when we released the episode of the Viper. But one thing we didn't focus on is the kind of crankshafts engine use. And when the C8R, Chevy's race car version of the C8, came out to Daytona this year to race, people's ears it perked up to the exhaust notes coming out the back. Have you ever wondered why European high revving V8s have an engine sound that differs so greatly from the low rumble of V8s in American made cars. I mean, they both have eight cylinders. They both are in a V formation. They both are four stroke engines, but an American, 
it sounds like this. And a European engine, it sounds like this. So what gives? Well, you might jump to say, well, Jerry, baby, they have different exhaust systems, so of course they're gonna sound different. And I'm gonna say, yeah, I'm sure they got different exhausts, but what if we take the exhaust out of the equation, huh? The reason they sound so different is because of the kind of crankshaft they use. Now, the job of the crankshaft is to take the linear motion of the piston, that's their up and down movement like this, and turn that into a rotational motion. So the crankshaft sits in the bottom of the V in the block is right here, right? And it's connected to the pistons via the connecting rods. And along the length of the crankshaft are crank journals, also called crank pins. And those are the exact spots to where those connecting rods attach to. And the orientation of those crank journals determines the type of crankshaft as well as the firing order on that engine. And this is where we can start to differentiate the flat plane crankshaft and the cross plane crankshaft. Now a flat plane crankshaft has crank journals 180 degrees out of phase from each other, meaning that every 180 degrees of rotation, a cylinder fires. Now, if you were to cross section that crank by drawing a line through it, you only need a single plane to split the crank journals at their center lines. You need a single flat plane. With cross plane cranks, the journals are 90 degrees out of phase from each other. And if we apply the same cross section method from before, you need two planes to cut through the center line of those journals. And if you look down the barrel of the crank, those planes form a cross, hence the name cross plane. Did. Go tell your mom you just learned some freaking mechanical nerd stuff. She's going to be like, Dylan, go eat your corn pops. Now with American made V8 engines, the most common of the two crankshafts is the cross plane. Hemi uses a cross plane crankshaft, Camaros use them, almost every Mustang uses them. I know the GT350 doesn't, even the base model Corvette uses it with their LT2 engine. Pretty much any American made V8 comes with a cross plane crankshaft. One of the main reasons cross plane engines are more common is due to the fact that they have a smoother operation. Now to explain this, let's take a V8 engine and let's number the cylinders like this. Cylinders one through eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And if we look at the firing order in the 6.2 liter V8 in the CA Corvette, for example, its cylinders fire in the following order. It goes from one to eight, to seven, to two, to six, to five, to four, to three. And we can see that we go from one side of the engine to the other side. There's a balance between the two banks of cylinders. This added in the fact that there are counterbalancers on the crankshaft to account for the weight of the pistons and rods, as well as the forces in between the strokes, we have a very smooth operating engine. If we look at the order of the firing inside a single bank, they have uneven space firing. That's what creates that distinct chunky rumble sound of a good old American V8. Because the firing of the cylinders is uneven, the exhaust gases leaving is also uneven, and it's the exhaust pulses that make that noise. That perfect perfect sound in the American V8. Nailed it. So that is the cross plane. What's all the hubbub about the flat plane cranks? And flat plane cranks have actually been around longer. From a design standpoint, they're actually simpler. Like I mentioned earlier, flat plane cranks fire every 180 degrees of rotation. No matter the firing order, flat plane engines will always alternate back and forth between the two cylinder banks. It's the equivalent of having two inline fours firing off. And this in turn produces more efficient exhaust scavenging. See, during the exhaust stroke, you create a pulse of high speed gas leaving the cylinder flowing down the headers. And this fast moving pulse creates a pressure difference and it turn pulls a vacuum, pulling more exhaust gas out and more fresh air in. And as RPMs increase, the air flows faster and the effects of scavenging become stronger. And the more efficient you are with that, the more power you make. It's also what gives the flat plane crank its unique sound. That rush of gas leaving the cylinder has a very on beat order. This is actually the best way to visualize it. Watch and listen. Pretty cool, pretty cool, pretty American. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> also pretty cool. Which one do you like? Let me know in the comments.
So if that's why flat plane V8s sound different, why are they considered better than its cross plane Robro? Well, one, you have lower rotating mass due to less counterweights needed on the crankshaft. Now the downside is you get more vibration issues because you no longer have any counterbalancers on the crankshaft. And as the engine size gets larger, so does the roughness and vibration of the engine. The bigger the engine is, the more that vibration propagates. But at the end of the day, who cares, man? You got a freaking race car engine. Race car drivers don't care about some vibrations. They want to go faster. They want more efficient, more powerful engines. And that is what a flat plane crank does. Now there hasn't been an official release from GM about the Z06, but there's some footage out there of it, of one driving around the canyons, and it sounds nothing like the base C8. And I got a little insider information from one of the chief engineers at the C8 program. He told me, shh, keep, don't, don't be quiet that um, remember when they raced that C8R in Daytona? Well, homologation rules state that for them to race that car, they had to build 300 production models. So if you read between the lines, we're getting a Z06 with a flat plane crank engine, baby. Woo! For, oh, dude, Ferrari, we're coming for your Italian stallion. <laughs> This episode is sponsored by Omaze. We've worked with them before to give dream cars away like a BMW M8 Competition Coupe, a Porsche 911 GT3 RS, and now we're giving you the chance to win your very own 2020 Corvette Stingray Z51. All you gotta do is go to omaze.com slash donut and enter right now, you know right now, for a chance to win this car with taxes and shipping included plus $20,000 cash to spend however you want. And the best part is every donation supports an organization that means so much to me and the rest of the Donut Media family, the Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center. It was their critical work that helped save the life of our very own James Pumphrey. So we love them over there. So please click the link or go to omaze.com slash donut and donate right now. Thank you so much for your support. We love you. Bye for now.